This is the Music History In-Depth Podcast for August 28th through September 3rd. On this week's show, a musical organization is started to combat racism from a couple of very surprising sources, and no, we're only partially talking about present-day politics. Plus, since that topic is pretty depressing, we're going to do a bunch of birthdays, including one for a king, one for a knight, and a bunch of rock and roll Hall of Fame inductees. This show goes more in-depth about some of the events that we put on our daily podcast, the Music History Today podcast, which drops every single day, including weekends, wherever you get your podcast from. Now, on to this week's episode. Let's start off by going to a rock festival. Back in 1982, Apple billionaire Steve Wozniak, better known as the Woz these days, thought that his generation was a little too into themselves. Honestly, I think every generation is a little too into themselves, but that's neither here nor there. Anyway, the Woz decided that what the 80s needed was love, sweet love. And what better way to do it than with a rock festival? Unlike the now infamous Firefest, Woz got help from someone who knew how to do these things from the ground up, a legendary promoter, Bill Graham. Off they went to Glen Helen Regional Park in the San Bernardino area of California. They built a brand new venue, which Woz paid for, bulldozing and everything, along with a new stage. The festival was spread out over two weekends over two years. The first festival weekend was held on Labor Day weekend, September 3rd through the 5th of 1982. How's this for a lineup for a show? Friday's show started with technology demonstrations because, well, why not? And who doesn't get excited by new technology demonstrations during a music festival? But what the hey, it's not anybody's festivals but the Waz's and he's a tech guy, so there you go. After all that fun was over with, it was New Wave Night, starting with Gang of Four, Oingo Boingo, the Ramones, who weren't New Wave, but again, whatever, not anyone's festival but the Waz's, he can do what he wants. Also, the Talking Heads, the B-52s, the Beat, better known as the English Beat these days, I guess, and the Police. Saturday had sets by Dave Edmonds. Eddie Money, Pat Benatar, Santana, The Cars, The Kinks, and Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. And Sunday's shows had Fleetwood Mac, The Grateful Dead, Jackson Brown, Jerry Jeff Walker, and the festival finished with a set by Jimmy Buffett. The second festival was held in late May of 1983. This time it was a four-day show with Barry Fay promoting it instead of Bill Graham. Guess those two fell out. This weekend was more historical from a musical standpoint. It featured the coming out party in America for both NXS and U2. It was also at this concert that Mick Jones played with The Clash. He would leave the group soon thereafter. Van Halen played, as did Willie Nelson, Motley Crue, The English Beat, The Vinyls, Stevie Nicks, and The Stray Cats. Lots of people showed up for both events, but with Waz footing the bill, he still lost money. About $24 million between both weekends. Also, there were over 100 arrests, at least 35 drug overdoses, and an apparent murder of a hitchhiker who was going to the show. Okay, at least the Firefest didn't kill anyone. Not that we know of, anyway. Also, aside from a couple of members of the English Beat, there were no black artists during either festival weekend. Hmm. Mm-mm-mm. Still, being a billionaire does have its perks, and the Waz was no different when he put on the first of his two Us Music Festivals, which ran from September 3rd through the 5th, Labor Day weekend, 1982. Next. Forgiving celebrities for past transgressions is something that's always fascinated me. We easily forgive some while we revile others. I'll give you a couple examples. O.J. Simpson continues to be vilified for the double murder and armed robbery issues, while basketball superstar Kobe Bryant is looked at as a legend, but rarely are his marital infidelities and his rape trial mentioned. Now, 
It could be that it involves the severity of the situation. However, Jay-Z went to trial for assault, and no one ever brings that up except when singing H to the Izzo, which has his trial in the lyrics. Mel Gibson is back in everybody's good graces, even though he was caught screaming at his family with some really not nice things to say, including Mel making several racist remarks. Chris Brown is still getting award nominations and selling records, even though he's had a large number of legal issues, including the alleged abuse of Rihanna. Even Mr. I Love Nazis Kanye is getting number one records, despite all of his issues. See? Land of second chances and forgiveness. I bring all of this up because this story has to do with three topics that are pretty relevant to today's political climate. Racism, immigration, and second chances. What if I told you that two of the most revered artists of the past 80 years or so both made racist remarks that lit the fuse and pissed off enough people that a musical organization was actually started to help combat them, which culminated in an iconic ad hoc concert? First, let's throw some context into this whole thing so that you don't seem to think that it's about Donald Trump or the Brexit vote or the refugee crisis, although the refugee crisis will come up at the very end of this. Back in 1968, a British conservative member of parliament, English parliament that is, named Enoch Powell gave what he called the Birmingham speech but it is now more well known as the River of Blood speech. In it, Powell criticized people from British Commonwealth member countries like Jamaica immigrating to England, along with criticizing a bill making its way through Parliament at the time called the Race Relations Bill. Full disclosure, my mother was one of those people, along with several of my family members who immigrated to England from Jamaica. They were known as the Windrush Generation, named after one of the first ships that brought immigrants to England called the Windrush to help build England back up again after the Nazis pummeled it during World War II. That's right, people. I was actually born in England. I know, the accent kind of fools you a little. I'll explain. It's where my parents met. My dad was an American military member. We didn't stay in England all that long after I was born, only about five years before coming to America, but I do have dual citizenship, so there you go. I can be prime minister. Not going to. Anyway, the speech was seen as being pretty divisive. When he was talking about member countries, he was not referring to those countries like Australia or Canada, who are also part of the British Commonwealth. Now, he was referring to people with let's just say darker complexions. Does any of this sound a lot like today's political climate? Yeah, we never seem to learn from history, do we? At that time, there was, and still is, a political party known as the National Front. Think of them as the British version of the Ku Klux Klan. In the 1970s, thanks to Powell and people like him, they were feeling pretty powerful at the time. They held violent protests and beat up black people on the streets at will and without much interference from the police, mind you. Any black people or any other ethnic minority for that matter, it didn't matter to these people. They even went to concerts with black musicians and went up on stage and beat black artists up while they were performing. To be black and perform in England in the 1970s literally meant risking your own lives. In the mid-1970s, feeling that the time was right to push his agenda, Enoch Powell decided again to run for high office. During his run, he received a surprise endorsement of sorts. Enter guitar god Eric Clapton. In 1976, Eric performed a concert in Birmingham, England. During the concert at which he was drunk, he threw his support behind Powell and said that England was, quote, overcrowded, end quote, and that Powell would stop England from becoming, quote, a black colony, end quote. Clapton then said that England should, quote, get the foreigners out, get the wogs out, and get the coons out, end quote. 
For the record, by the way, WOG is a racial slur for black, Middle Eastern, and Southeast Asian people, just in case you ever hear it at any time. Eric then started chanting, Keep Britain White, which is the slogan for the National Front. Not to be outdone, another rock legend decided in multiple interviews to step into the mix himself. In interviews with Playboy magazine and other publications, David Bowie, of all people, showed support for fascism. He said, quote, Britain is ready for a fascist leader. I think Britain could benefit from a fascist leader. After all, fascism is really nationalism. I believe very strongly in fascism. People have always responded with greater efficiency under a regimental leadership. End quote. He also called Hitler the first real rock star. Clapton and Bowie later apologized for their remarks, with Clapton finally doing it in 2018, a full 42 years after the fact. Better late than ever, I guess. Both Clapton and Bowie blamed drug and alcohol use, among other things, although even as late as 2007, Clapton still supported Powell's cause and didn't think that Powell was a racist. Boy, does this sound like the statements coming out of people's mouths after that whole white nationalist parade in Charlottesville, Virginia a little while back, or what? Now, the fact that Clapton played blues music, which was primarily black music, was not lost on more than a few people, including a guy by the name of Red Saunders, who wrote a letter to British music magazine NME in which he stated that Clapton's comments were, quote, all the more disgusting because he had his first hit, solo hit that is, with a cover of reggae star Bob Marley's I Shot the Sheriff. Come on, Eric, own up. Half your music is black. Who shot the sheriff, Eric? It sure as hell wasn't you. End quote. This letter wasn't just some angry whining. It ended with a call to arms. In that same letter to the editor, Saunders called for a group to be put together called Rock Against Racism. The response was so good that on August 29th, 1976, Rock Against Racism was formed by Saunders, Roger Huddle, among many other people. The mission of the group was to promote unity and love and to get kids to not embrace racism. The group started to do concerts with multicultural acts and to do marches. It wasn't a national organization per se. It was really a ragtag group of local units in different cities doing their own thing, but with a common goal. On April 30th, 1978, the London branch of Rock Against Racism put on a concert at Victoria Park. They were first going to gather at Trafalgar Square and then march to Victoria Park for a rally and music festival. Organizers expected maybe 10,000 people at best. They got over 100,000. As they marched to the concert, they chanted slogans such as Black and White, Unite and Fight. The group was so large that even the National Front members who were in the area to start trouble with them had to go and run and hide. Yeah, yeah, that's what happens when you bully the bully. The music festival itself was a do-it-yourself event. Volunteers put the stage together. Electricity flow was so bad that sometimes the instruments faded in and out. The Clash were the headliners with Steel Pulse and other groups filling in for the undercard. It's one of those concert events that's kind of taken on a legend of its own and is still celebrated to this day as the day England stood up against racism. Okay, at least for a little while. As far as rock against racism, well, the group has been active and inactive over the years. But now, and the reason why we bring this up, because of the far-right riots that just literally happened in England in 2024 in August, rock against racism is back and active again, with concerts being held all over the United Kingdom. Let's circle back, though, to what started this whole organization getting together to begin with. What became of Clapton and Bowie's reputations? Well, once they apologized, they were basically forgiven. In fact, if I hadn't have brought all of this up, you probably would have never have known about this, because honestly, I didn't actually until I started researching this event. 
Now, I'm not sure how I really feel about them, to be truthful. For starters, blaming any of your racist thoughts on drugs and alcohol has always been a pretty lame excuse, in my opinion. Sure, you can blame them for your actions, but not for your thoughts. Those words, after all, came from their heads and their hearts, not from a bottle or a syringe. Much to think about. In Bowie's case, he also said that he was in a different state of being at the time and had been into the occult and was reading a lot of fascist literature, but saw how wrong he was. Boy, that sounds awfully familiar to a few of, well, let's not say his name, but it relates to today. He went about changing his way, bringing more ethnic minorities into the spotlight, including helping to give R&B superstar Luther Vandross a spotlight by writing songs with him and with Luther singing backup vocals on the song Young Americans. He famously went after MTV in an interview for not playing black artists on their channel in the early 1980s. Clapton, however, never really did much to make amends other than an apology 42 years later. I could be wrong on that, but to date, other than playing music with black artists, which he was already doing anyway, I haven't really found much in terms of him reaching out to try to make amends for anything. These days, though, no one makes much mention of either Clapton or Bowie's past comments. People forgive, or at least they forget. All right, not everybody. Look at the reaction to OJ's death as evidence of anybody forgiving or forgetting that guy. In any event, at least some good did come from all of this when the Rock Against Racism music organization was formed on August 29th, 1976. Before we go any further, we'd like to tell you about our other podcasts. The Music History Today podcast goes over the daily events in music history and drops daily, including weekends, on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. There's also the Music Halls of Fame podcast, which talks about a member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, along with other Music Halls of Fame's museums and walks of fame. The Music Halls of Fame podcast drops every Thursday and can also be found on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. Now, back to this podcast. Well, after that cheery subject, let us turn our attention to some cheeriness and celebrate some birthdays. There are so many big birthdays this week that I'm splitting this up by date and giving you a couple of segments. First off, this Canadian singer-songwriter was born Eileen Regina Edwards. She is the biggest selling female country act of all time and one of the biggest selling artists, male or female, of any genre of music of all time. Her third album, Come On Over, sold over 40 million copies. She had to stop performing for a decade due to problems with her voice, but she came back in 2015 to do a tour. She is now known by her stage name, Shania Twain. Born August 28, 1965. Next, this country music superstar burst onto the scene at the age of 13, in which people compared her to a young Patsy Cline. She then started to move to more country pop, started a chain of hit songs and best-selling albums. These days, she acts and sings different genres, even doing a vocal turn on the Crystal Method's last album. Her first name is actually Margaret, but she goes by her middle name, Leanne. Country music superstar Leanne Rimes, born August 28, 1982. August 29th saw a few music legends born, one of whom I'm saving for the last segment, actually. You'll understand why when you know who it is. First off, this jazz legend invented a style called bebop. His saxophone playing was revolutionary with altered chords and playful harmonics. His life was tragically cut short at the age of 34 after years of heroin abuse by pneumonia, a bleeding ulcer, and heart attack, among other things that ended up killing him. Not drugs, though, just the effects from it. However, he was and still is considered a hero of the beat generation. The man whose original nickname was Yardbird, but then was just shortened up to Bird. 
jazz legend Charlie Bird Parker, born August 29, 1955. Also born on August 29th, this legend is a vocal one from the jazz era. Like many jazz artists, she started singing young and started working her way up through the clubs. Her first big hit was What a Difference a Day Makes. Her vocal style crossed over to many genres, so much so that she has been inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Unfortunately, her life was also cut tragically short, just like Charlie Parker's. Hers at the age of 39 from a prescription drug overdose. Born Ruth Lee Jones, the great jazz vocalist Dinah Washington, born August 29th, 1924. Now for something that's completely different and honestly not covered much on these podcasts, EDM. This DJ is a producer who helped to give actress Brittany Murphy a big dance hit with Faster Kill Pussycat. He's been around actually since the early 1980s and he's one of the first superstar EDM DJs. He's produced many hits and remixes including Starry Eyed Surprise, Ready Steady Go, Switch On, and Sex and Money. He is DJ Paul Oakenfold, born August 30th, 1963. This next man helped to front one of the biggest groups of the counterculture movement with the Mamas and the Papas. He also helped to promote the Monterey Pop Music Festival in 1967, which introduced the mainstream to Jimi Hendrix and Otis Redding, among others. His daughter, China, herself became a big music star in the 1990s with the group Wilson Phillips, while two of his other children, Mackenzie and Bijou, became popular actresses. He also, even after death, and especially after death, became the subject of much ridicule and accusations of sexual abuse and whatnot, but we won't get into those right now. In any event, he is Papa John Phillips, born August 30th, 1935. Let's continue on with some birthdays. This man is a music legend, but perhaps nowhere more so than in his native Ireland. In fact, he was knighted for his promotion of the country and its culture. His style is R&B, along with soul mixed in with a little pop. He was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and some of his biggest hits include Brown Eyed Girl and Moondance. The man known officially as Sir George Ivan Morrison OBE, but... You can call him Van for short. Van Morrison, born August 31st, 1945. Next, this singer had one of the best debut albums by a female of the 1980s when she came out of the blue at the age of 17 with several hits. Her follow-up album continued the hit parade, and she's, of course, gone on to do Broadway and acting now, but she still performs her hits on the road and, of course, the occasional 80s reunion boat cruises. She is Miss Debbie Gibson, who was born on August 31st, 1970. This next lady was also big in the 80s, but her career stretched into the 90s. She was involved in a very serious accident when her tour bus was hit, but she came back strong and in a big way. She is now on VH1 and Billboard Magazine's list of greatest artists of all time. Both her and her husband are cultural icons from the days when they were in the group Miami Sound Machine. In fact, she has a Broadway musical based on her life and romance with her husband called Get On Your Feet. She is Miss Gloria Estefan, born September 1st, 1957. Next... This man is considered one of the 100 greatest guitarists of all time, according to Rolling Stone magazine. He had a group for a time with members of Duran Duran and Guns N' Roses called Neurotic Outsiders. He had 14 criminal convictions as a kid, but decided to join a band instead of continuing a life of crime. Good choice, since that band helped to change music and landed him in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. The guitarist is Mr. Steve Jones of the group The Sex Pistols, born September 3rd, 1955. (music) 
These last two birthdays are huge, especially to Gen Xers like myself. Both of these guys started as members of groups with their brothers. With one, his brothers are no longer alive, unfortunately. With the other, his brothers are alive, but he is not. Let's start with the first one. The brothers Gibb, or the Bee Gees, had two parts to their careers. The brothers of Barry, Robin, and Maurice were born on the Isle of Man in England, then lived in Manchester, England. Barry was the oldest, having been born on September 1, 1946, while the twins, Maurice and Robin, were born on December 22, 1949. They started out in a band called the Rattlesnakes in 1955, but when the band broke up, they formed a band called Johnny Hayes and the Blue Cats. Johnny Hayes only lasted about four months as the Gibb family moved to Queensland, Australia, and there they plied their trade by playing at a racetrack as the entertainment break and also in the resort towns along the coast. At this time, they found a manager who got them a record deal, and they came up with their name, the Bee Gees. They released about three singles a year that didn't do anything except for a minor hit called Wine and Women. After four years, the brothers finally scored a major hit with their 12th song called Spicks and Specks. In 1967, they moved to England again in search of bigger success, and there they met up with the guy who would become instrumental in their success, record executive Robert Stigwood. Under Stigwood's hand, the Bee Gees had some big hits like Massachusetts and To Love Somebody, but then the pressure of fame got to them and they broke up in the late 1960s. However, they eventually got back together in the mid-1970s and started changing their sound to disco, which was sort of underground at that point. It was at this point where fate took over and gave them their magnum opus, Saturday Night Fever. Here's some trivia about the movie that turned the Bee Gees into superstars. It was all based on fake news. Here's what happened. In 1976, music and movie producer Robert Stigwood at that time was looking for his next big hit. He had just come off of making two successful movie musicals after his career just being a music executive. He was the one who helped to produce Jesus Christ Superstar and The Who's Tommy. An article in New York Magazine caught his attention. It was titled, The Tribal Rights of the New Saturday Night by Nick Cohen. The article told the story of a guy named Vinny and his buddies who were dancers in a discotheque in Brooklyn and who had always dreamt of something bigger. Stigwood was hooked on the story and decided to turn the article into a movie. Vinny became Tony Manero. Stigwood got the Bee Gees to do the soundtrack as they were already making new music for a new album anyway. The Bee Gees just grabbed all of their new music, put it on the soundtrack instead. And then Stigwood grabbed an up-and-coming actor from a television show and released the movie called Saturday Night Fever. Saturday Night Fever became one of the biggest movies of the year. It turned the actor, John Travolta, into an international star, along with getting him an Academy Award nomination for playing Tony. It turned the Bee Gees into one of the biggest musical acts of the century and brought disco out of the minority and gay clubs and made the musical genre mainstream. Soon, every city had disco clubs. Radio stations changed their formats to disco, and even if they didn't, they at least had a top 10 disco list every week just to stay relevant with the times. Here's the thing, though. The article that was written by Nick Cohen was actually fake. There was no Vinny. There was no discotheque in Brooklyn. The entire thing was based on Nick's friends in England. He admitted this in an interview almost 30 years after the fact. So in actuality, Saturday Night Fever is based on fake news. All this while while they were being big in the disco era, 
Barry was writing chart-topping songs for other artists, including Dolly Parton and Kenny Rogers' hit, Islands in the Stream, an entire duet album with himself and Barbara Streisand. He also wrote songs for Dionne Warwick, Frankie Avalon, Conway Twitty, Olivia Newton-John, Tina Turner, Terry Desario, along with writing for his other younger brother, Andy Gibb, and, of course, also the Bee Gees. After the success of Saturday Night Fever, the group put out another chart-topping album called Spirits Having Flown. The Bee Gees' other brother, Andy, became a huge star in his own right with his album Shadow Dancing. And then, tragedy struck the family. First, the inevitable backlash against disco happened that crushed many careers, and the Bee Gees were very much among them. Dance music went back to the underground, got mixed with more electronic music, and became techno, house music, trance music, and eventually the EDM explosion of the 2010s. The disco backlash completely hurt all of the brothers' careers. Both the band and Andy Gibb went from being the biggest worldwide acts of the late 1970s to being laughing stocks in the early 1980s as people's tastes went more into corporate rock and new wave music, especially thanks to MTV. Brothers Maurice and Andy developed drug and alcohol problems. Andy passed away in 1988 from an inflammation of the heart due to a viral infection. Some people have said, though, that it was really because his heart had been damaged from cocaine addiction that he had gotten over by then, but it had left his heart unable to cope with the viral infection. Regardless, Andy's passing at the age of 30 gutted the Bee Gees. They continued on despite their problems, playing what turned out to be their final concert together in 2002. Then, in 2003, while waiting for surgery to take care of an intestinal issue, Maurice had a heart attack and passed away in 2003 at the age of 53. The remaining brothers made appearances until 2012 when Robin Gibb, who had liver cancer, passed away at the age of 61 from kidney and liver issues. Since then, Barry has performed periodically with his son along with his niece and nephew, along with keeping the band's legacy going with album releases and also now a planned biopic. The Bee Gees together have sold over 220 million records and have won five Grammy Awards, all for the soundtrack to Saturday Night Fever. The soundtrack is 132 on Rolling Stone's Top 500 Greatest Albums of All Time list. And even after Saturday Night Fever, they kept the disco sound going with Spirits Having Flown. They have 35 top 100 singles, and during the Saturday Night Fever era, they had three of the top five songs in the exact same week on the Billboard Singles Chart. They also wrote and produced a bunch of chart-topping songs, like I said before. The group was also put into the Library of Congress National Recording Registry for the Saturday Night Fever soundtrack in 2013. One of the greatest songwriters of all time. Mr. Barry Gibb of the Bee Gees, born on September 1st, 1946. This second brother is the third music legend this week on the podcast who was born on August 29th, who I saved for the very end. He is one of the very few artists to be inducted multiple times into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. He is the only artist who I know of who is in as both a member of a family group and also as a solo artist. Let's give a little context to his background and what drove him. The Jackson Five were formed in Gary, Indiana. It consisted of brothers Jackie, Tito, Jermaine, Marlon, and their little brother Michael, who was born on August 29, 1958. Their father, Joe, had a dream of becoming a professional boxer, but he put all that aside in order to support his family, taking a job as a crane operator in the Gary, Indiana area. Joe also had dreams of becoming a musician. He started a band called the Falcons with his younger brother, Luther, and their friend, Pookie Hudson, but the band broke up. Hudson started his own group, which became the doo-wop group, the Spaniels, who had the hit song, Good Night, Sweetheart, Good Night. As with a lot of parents who had dreams that didn't quite work out for one reason or another, Joe pushed his musical dreams onto his sons. 
He was an excellent taskmaster, extreme to be precise, who would make the brothers practice for hours on end in order to hone their craft. To some people, his behavior with his family bordered on abuse. These days, that would at least get you a visit from child services. But this was the 1960s, so uh, no. The J-5, as they are sometimes called, started playing talent shows and then started doing theater shows like Harlem's Apollo Theater. It was at the Apollo that Gladys Knight first heard them and sent their demo tape to Motown Records where their tape was rejected. They were signed instead to a small label called Steeltown Records. The J-5 recorded the songs Big Boy and We Don't Have to Be Over 21 to Fall in Love with Steeltown Records. They performed as the opening act for the group Bobby Taylor and the Vancouver's at the Regal Theater in Chicago, Illinois. Bobby was so impressed that he arranged for the J-5 to get a second shot with Motown. He set up an audition where this time president and owner Barry Gordy listened to their audition tape. And yet again, Motown turned them down. They did not want a young act at that time because they already had a young act. A teenager by the name of Little Stevie Wonder? Wonder what ever happened to that guy. Hmm. Now, well. However, after thinking about a little while, Motown decided to take a chance and they signed the band to a contract. And yes, we all know what happened to Little Stevie Wonder. He became Stevie Wonder, the man, the myth, the legend there is. In 1969, the J-5 recorded and released their full-length debut album called Diana Ross Presents the Jackson 5. Fellow Motown artist Diana had become the group's caretaker of sorts for Motown in order to get the group acclimated to the Motown assembly line way of doing things and to also get them some extra publicity because Diana was a huge star at that time. That album had one release, but it was a big one. It was their first number one smash single, I Want You Back. In the next six years, the J5 put out 14 albums for Motown Records, including a live album, a Christmas album, a soundtrack album, and a 1971 Greatest Hits album, which for the record was the first album that I ever bought that was not considered a kid's album like Sesame Street. Very proud of that fact. Thank you very much. 1975's Moving Violation was the last studio album that they put out for the Motown label. They also released 17 singles that hit the Billboard Top 100 charts, and out of those 17 songs, their first four songs hit number one, and they had three others that hit number two. The group had the hits on Motown like ABC, I Want You Back, Stop the Love You Save, I'll Be There, Mama's Pearl, Never Can Say Goodbye, Maybe Tomorrow, Dancing Machine, Going Back to Indiana, and Sugar Daddy. They also became teen idols with a TV variety show, which introduced their sister, Janet, to America, and also a Saturday morning cartoon show, which I used to watch in combination with the Osmond Brothers cartoon show. Yes, I'm old. Shut up. Anyway, in 1976, the group left Motown for Epic Records. Jermaine Jackson left the group and stayed with Motown, having a decent solo career, and also, of course, being married to uh, Barry Gordy's daughter, so he really couldn't leave. That would have been bad at Thanksgiving. The Jackson 5 became the Jacksons and put out six albums. They had 13 more singles, hit the Billboard Top 100 singles chart, with three of those hitting the top 10. Of course, during that time, they also had Michael break out and have a Hall of Fame solo career. Michael had actually started his solo career while the Jackson 5 were at Motown. His first solo album was 1972's Got to Be There. He followed that up with Ben later that year. The title track from that album was also the theme song for the movie Ben about a boy and his rat. And how all the rats attacked and killed people. Cozy little movie. There was a reboot not that long ago with Crispin Glover. Anyway, Michael's theme song won a Golden Globe Award for Best Song and was also nominated for an Academy Award. He didn't win that year, though. He followed that album with 1973's Music and Me and 1975's Forever Michael. He next went and worked on the movie version of the Broadway musical The Wiz, starring Diana Ross as Dorothy. In 
The musical director for The Wiz was Quincy Jones. Quincy and Michael hit it off and decided to work together on Michael's next solo album. That album was recorded between December 1978 and June 1979 in Los Angeles. Michael wrote three songs, Don't Stop Till You Get Enough, Working Day and Night, and Get On The Floor. Rod Temperton, who used to be in the band Heat Wave, wrote Off The Wall and Burn This Disco Out. Stevie Wonder, the little Stevie Wonder from before, of course, wrote I Can't Help It. Carol Bayer Sager and David Foster wrote It's The Falling In Love. Still a very underrated Michael Jackson song, not going to lie. And, of course, Paul McCartney wrote Girlfriend. She's Out of My Life was written by Tom Baylor, who wrote the song in 1976. For that song, Michael spent the time learning the words instead of reading them while he was recording the song. The song affected him so much that while he was singing it, he started crying. Quincy decided to leave the crying in the final edit of the song. Off the Wall, the album, was released on August 10, 1979. There were five singles released off the album. Don't Stop Till You Get Enough and Rock With You both hit number one on the Billboard Singles Chart, while Off the Wall and She's Out of My Life hit the top ten and are still played on radio to this day. The fifth song that was released was Girlfriend. As for the album, it became the third biggest album of 1980 and was nominated for two Grammy Awards, winning one. After that success, the Jacksons, with Michael, released Triumph, which had the hits Heartbreak Hotel and Lovely One. Although Michael's solo album, Off the Wall, had sold over 20 million copies worldwide and had spawned all those hits, the album did not get an Album of the Year nomination at the Grammy Awards. Michael was pissed. In fact, he was so upset, he vowed that his next album would be bigger and also respected more by the Grammys. What's more, he had also tried to get on magazine covers, but Rolling Stone famously declined to do a story on him. As he told someone afterwards, quote, I've been told before over and over that black people on the cover of magazines do not sell copies. Just wait. Someday those magazines are going to be begging me for an interview. Maybe I'll give them one, and maybe I won't. End quote. And no, I was not going to do that in a Michael Jackson voice. That would have just been wrong. Uh, anyway. No, I'm just, just kidding. Just kidding. Anyway. With that in mind, Michael went to work on his new album, he recruited Quincy Jones again, who had, of course, produced Off the Wall, to produce this one. And they recorded 30 songs, agreeing to nine of them for the album. He got Rod Temperton back to write a few songs, including Thriller, got horror film master Vincent Price to do the voice towards the end of the song, which Vincent managed to pull off in only two takes. Pretty quick work for the amount of money he was making. He recruited the members of the group Toto to play on songs like Beat It, had Eddie Van Halen do a guitar solo, and got Paul McCartney to duet on a song. And when all was said and done, both Michael and Quincy listened to it and hated it. They then spent the next two months stripping down the songs, remixing them, and bickering over them. Finally, on November 30th, 1982, Michael released the album Thriller. At first, it did okay. The Girl Is Mine with Paul McCartney was the lead single and went top 10. The next single, Billie Jean, had a little intrigue, some infighting, and of course a little history to go with it. The song was written by Michael, and it tells the story about a woman who accuses a man of being the father of her child. According to Michael, the song is not about one woman, but rather about a bunch of women who accused his brothers of fathering their children back when he and the family went out on tour. According to a few other reports, though, the song is really about one crazed fan in particular who accused Michael of fathering one of her twins. Don't ask me how that's possible. I have no idea. Then, after sending him a crazed letter after crazed letter, sent him a letter with a gun telling him to kill himself at a certain time because if they couldn't be together in life, then they would be together in death right after she killed their baby. 
Thankfully, that did not happen. The woman was found and ended up in a psychiatric hospital. Mercy. Quincy Jones actually didn't like the song at first and didn't think that it belonged on the album. He didn't like the opening, in fact, at all. Michael wouldn't change it. Michael wanted co-producing credit for the song because, according to Michael, the actual song was pretty close to the demo that Michael had made. And Quincy said, absolutely not, no way, no how. And their arguing got to the point where they didn't even talk to each other for a week. Another thing about the song was what they called sonic personality, which is when you hear the very first seconds of the song, you know exactly which song it is and who did the song. Since the first few seconds of Billie Jean are drums, that meant doing something a little different. They built a special drum platform and a few other tricks to get that unique drum sound that you hear at the very beginning. No, it's not a drum machine. It's an actual drum. There were two other things that helped to make this song and album historic. The first was the music video. Directed by Steve Barron, MTV refused to play the video as they were, quote, a classic rock and roll station, end quote, which was really their way of saying that they don't put black people on the channel. Michael's record label president, Walter Yetnikoff, famously threatened to pull every single one of the videos off of the channel that his record label owned unless they played Michael's video. And when that record label was CBS Records, the biggest record label in the world at that time, that threat carried an awful lot of weight. MTV relented and played Billie Jean. Good thing, as it helped to make both the song and MTV itself very popular. The second thing that made the song so popular was a TV special. The Motown 25 special was recorded on March 25th, 1983 in Pasadena, California. No one knew it at the time, but the one performance that day was going to electrify the world. The special itself was actually pretty good. There were a ton of Motown greats on there. You had Stevie Wonder, Marvin Gaye came back to do a segment since he had left Motown at that point. Junior Walker, Mary Wells, Martha Reeves were all there. Knight had a ton of reunions. Diana Ross performed with the Supremes. Smokey Robinson performed with the Miracles. And Michael and his brothers got back together to do a performance there. The Jacksons performed a medley of their biggest Motown hits, and then they all left the stage except for Michael. Michael then performed Billie Jean, which was the only non-Motown song performed that night. And about midway through the song, he spun around, slid backwards, and spun three times. The crowd went wild, for they had just seen Michael Jackson perform the moonwalk for the very first time to Billie Jean. Now, the moonwalk itself was not a new dance. People have been doing versions of it for years. In fact, if you watch old videos of 1980s b-boy breakdancers, they did what was then known as sidestepping. Michael actually learned how to do the moonwalk from two dancers who had done it on the TV show Soul Train. He just took it to a whole other level and put his spin on it, no pun intended. At the time this special was recorded, his album Thriller had been out for about five months and was doing okay on the pop charts. Billie Jean was finally getting some airplay on MTV, but it wasn't a huge smash quite yet. Also, there was no internet to speak of at the time and no social media, so word hadn't gotten out about Michael's performance. That all changed on May 16, 1983, when the Motown special premiered on NBC television. Before that night, Michael was a popular artist with a bunch of hits with his brothers, the Jackson 5, and a few solo hits. After that night, all anyone could talk about was Michael's performance and especially the moonwalk. Billie Jean quickly flew up the charts to number one where it stayed for four weeks, that was then followed up by the song and music video for Beat It, which also flew up the charts to number one. The combination of Beat It and Billie Jean suddenly made MTV must-see television and turned the network into a pop culture phenomenon. As for Michael, it's hard to describe really to anyone these days just how huge he became. Okay, I'm going to try it this way. 
Take the craziness over Beyonce, Taylor Swift, Justin Bieber, BTS, NSYNC, and virtually every other teen obsession and combine them. And you still don't get close to the craziness that surrounded Michael Jackson. If you don't believe me, check out some of the footage from that era on YouTube, especially some of his live videos. The man literally had thousands of people outside every hotel he stayed at. They had to close off streets just so the guy could go from place to place. As for the album, it started selling a million copies a week. Plus, it went to number one and stayed there for almost half a year, only to be interrupted in that run a few times by other albums like Prince's Purple Rain soundtrack before going right back to number one. Michael received a lot of critical acclaim and eight Grammy Awards, including that elusive Album of the Year Grammy. The album has been certified to have sold now over 34 million copies in America, making it the second biggest selling album of all time in America behind the Eagles' Greatest Hits album. But it has claimed sales of 67 million copies worldwide. It, to this day, still sells almost 100,000 copies a week worldwide, and it is still the biggest selling album worldwide by far. And since album sales are no longer the way people purchase their music, that record will probably stand for generations. Oh, uh, also about those magazines that wouldn't put him on the cover. Well, Rolling Stone came back begging for him to do an interview with them, even though they had only given Thriller four out of five stars in their initial review. Who'd have thunk that one? Michael thought about it and then granted them the interview but only if they put him on the cover. They obliged, with that issue being the biggest selling issue in a very long time for Rolling Stone. I think I still actually have that issue in my collection somewhere. Even though Michael did not want to get back together with his brothers, his father talked him into it, and so they released the album Victory in 1984 and went out on the Victory Tour with Michael, which was a financial disaster due to mismanagement, but not due to popularity as ticket sales were pretty brisk. After that, though, Michael was officially done with the group and went off to make the albums Bad and Dangerous, along with becoming fodder for the tabloids with rumors about him buying the elephant man's bones and sleeping in a hyperbaric chamber and a whole lot of controversy, to be nice about it, which garnered him the nickname Wacko Jacko by the New York Post because such a classy paper. Anyway, there were also two cases in the criminal justice system on child molestation charges, including one felony case that he was acquitted of, at least in the criminal court system, but not necessarily in the court of public opinion. So as 2009 started, he found his career pretty much in freefall. By that time, he was rumored to be heavily in debt. His public image, of course, had taken quite the beating thanks to the criminal trials and also the tabloid behavior. Michael had gone from being the king of pop to becoming wacko jacko in the eyes of the media. Even when he held a protest against record labels for ripping off record artists, the media still portrayed him as a publicity stunt since he was years ahead of his time in talking openly about the ills of the recording industry and not owning your master copies. Michael aimed to get back on top, if only for a little while. In March of 2009, he announced a set of concerts called the This Is It Tour. It was supposed to start in London, then go to Paris, New York City, and Mumbai. The choreography was being done by Kenny Ortega, the IT choreographer at that point, after working on the hugely popular high school musical TV movie. The concert dates were set, which sold out immediately, and rehearsals began. Along with a career in decline and rumored heavy debt, very heavy debt, Michael was having health issues. He was especially having very serious problems sleeping. He enlisted the help of Dr. Conrad Murray to help him with the sleeping problems. Dr. Murray was giving him a combination of propofol and two anti-anxiety drugs and was supposed to be constantly supervising Michael's sleep while these drugs were being administered. 
on the evening of June 24th, Michael went to rehearsals for the tour. He ended rehearsals after midnight and then went home. During the morning of June 25th, Michael went to sleep. He never woke up. The coroner labeled his death a homicide. Dr. Murray was brought up on charges and convicted of involuntary manslaughter for leaving the room to take a phone call and for not monitoring Michael while the opioid drug cocktail was being administered to him to help him sleep. Dr. Murray served two years in prison for that. Michael's death overshadowed the death earlier that day of another Hollywood icon, actress Farrah Fawcett, who had passed away from cancer. As for the concert tour, well, thankfully, the final rehearsal was a dress rehearsal and it was being recorded. The footage from that final rehearsal was used in the concert film Michael Jackson, This Is It, which became the biggest money-making documentary of all time up to that point, despite only being in theaters for a few weeks. Michael Jackson released 10 studio albums while he was alive, along with five soundtrack albums, 35 compilation albums, 10 video albums, seven reissues, four box sets, and seven remix albums. Of those, 10 hit the top 10, including seven which hit number one. He also released 67 singles. Of those, 30 hit the top 10, including 15 which hit number one. He sold over 400 million copies of his singles and albums. He has won 13 Grammy Awards, 5 Billboard Music Awards, 6 Brit Awards, 24 American Music Awards, and he also holds 26 Guinness Book of World Records. Yet, despite all of that, when he became eligible for induction as a solo artist for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1997, the Hall overlooked him finally putting him in a few years after his first year eligibility. Go figure. The Life and Times of the King of Pop, Michael Jackson, born August 29th, 1958. And that is it for the Music History In-Depth podcast for August 28th through September 3rd. Thank you very, very much for listening and or also watching on YouTube or Spotify, or wherever you watch your videos. 